All right, so I'm going to do a pretty quick uh, video for Ericsson because I know that you guys um, hopefully have thought a lot about Ericsson in doing your playlists um, and we'll spend some class time um, talking about him at all um, as well. Um, so Eric Ericsson uh, is also born um, in Germany in the early 1900s uh, and was adopted by his um, stepfather when he was three and grows up believing that, uh, that this was his biological father and, and finds out only in adulthood that that's not true. Um, and he becomes part of Freud's inner circle, um, not in a deliberate way, but he starts teaching art to the children of many of Freud's uh, peers um, and gets to know Freud that way. Um, and then at 31, uh, and this is important in terms of identity development, um, he decides he's going to name himself, right? So Eric Erickson is not his given name, it is the name he takes. Um, and essentially he is his own son, right? He's created himself and it's hard not to connect that back to um, his, uh, his uh, false information about who his biological father was. Um, he also moves um, from Europe at that point and goes to Boston and starts working in neuropsychiatry at Harvard. So he really kind of reinvents his life uh, in his early 30s. Um, and over the course of his career, he worked at Yale and Berkeley and Harvard, uh, but stays in the United States until he retired in 1970. And, you know, 1994 to many of you seems like a long time ago, um, but, you know, it's fairly recent history um, in terms of uh, when he died. So it's important to see, you know, it's important to see Eric Erickson as somebody who was living and working in and around um, New England and even New Haven um, up until, um, you know, very close to when probably until uh, after some of you were born, but certainly close to when some of you were born. Um, so his basic ideas in terms of uh, differences with Freud, um, this is a much more, uh, a theory much more focused on health and a much more positive theory. He focuses a lot on the idea of ego as pushing us through developmental stages and the thing that, um, um, is a healthy motivator in our uh, development. Um, each of the stages that he gives us is going to add an important healthy piece to our personality if things go well. Um, but he also believed that you were able to go back and rework earlier stages if they didn't go well. Um, and it's easy to, again to see how that might come from his personal history that you know even um, when he thinks his identity might have been uh, impaired in some way that he reworks that in his own way um, so that's an important thing um, you don't I'm not going to talk a lot about unconscious motivation here he wouldn't have excluded that but it wasn't a big focus of his theory um, and he's much more interested in conscious experience he also doesn't focus much on sexuality and Freud really is the only one of these theorists that does um, and so um, he gives us eight stages, development here, personality development here for Erickson does not stop at age five as it did for Freud, but continues through to the end of life um, with us, again, adding these virtues um, as we go through. So if we look at his stages here, um, we have these eight stages. Um, and then we have the virtue that they come in. Not all lists are going to give you this basic virtue that's available. And I think it's really important because we tend to think about, well, the child either develops trust or mistrust. Um, but, and that's true, but um, Erickson talked in very eloquent ways around that if the child um, experienced trust in that first year and a half of life, then they would have hopefulness as part of their personality that they developed that as a basic virtue of their personality and that if they didn't develop trust, they didn't experience trust in that first um, year of life or so, um, that they would not be somebody who was hopeful um, and they wouldn't be somebody who um, had that going forward. Now, of course, right, we said it's not linear, so you can go back. So let's say you have a child who does not experience trust with, um, with his or her parents, um, family of origin, but then they get in, you know, they, they, they develop a romantic relationship in adulthood that is very much about trust and about somebody who's able to take care of them um, in appropriate ways. Um, then they might develop hope um, for the first time then. And so, um, and so it's important to know that you, you don't lose that opportunity, um, but you may need to work harder at going back and getting that opportunity. Um, and so I won't read through each of these, but I want you to pay attention to the virtues, right? And so in the second stage, will, um, you know, willfulness, um, or the ability to exert your will um, and pursue your will is a virtue you might develop. Um, a sense of purpose would be a virtue you might develop in um, those play years. Um, so, uh, you know, this is where children might say things like, I'm going to be an artist, or I'm going to be 
all right, um, or I am, right? I am an artist. I am a good at. They get a sense of um, what their purpose might be. Um, and not just long term, but even in the moment. Like, what are you going to do today? To, I'm, I'm going to make this thing happen. Um, right. Uh, and then during the school years, we get that sense of competency. Um, and, and this is, a, you know, for lots of kids, I think, if, because we spend so many hours um, in this classroom, um, that sense of competency for many people does come from, uh, you know, from whether they're succeeding in that very restricted academic setting. Um, and it's important, I think, uh, when you're raising children to make sure they have opportunities for a sense of industry and developing that sense of competence in other places, whether that's athletics or creative pursuits, um, but in other places where they can feel competent and to get a sense of themselves as competent. Um, identity versus role confusion is the stage that uh, Erickson probably wrote about the most. Um, and again, given his personal history, maybe not so surprising. Um, and, um, and so we do develop, you know, he does talk here and your book talks a bunch and we can talk together, um, about the idea of, um, what, what the possibilities are, what we want is full develop identity development by the end of adolescence. But sometimes you get uh, adolescents who, um, either don't have uh, a safe family support system that lets them explore identity. Um, and if you don't feel like you have that safe system, you're not going to do exploration and then you might just um either take an offered identity so your parents tell you that you should go into the family business and that's what you do um, or you um, become just like or just opposite of an older sibling right that's a way of just taking an identity rather than cho carefully choosing one that fits for you um, and then other people might um, just have what's called identity diffusion um, in a prolonged way where they just never really establish identity that um, who they are is going to be mostly defined by who what context they're in and who they're around um, and interesting here, Erickson says that the virtue will pick up in this stage is a sense of loyalty, that if you have a strong sense of your own identity, then you will also be a loyal person. Um, and I think, you know, in some ways, I wonder if the word steadfastness or something like that could also be used here. Uh, but that's the virtue of that stage. Um, in young adulthood, we're establishing intimate relationships. Those might be romantic relationships, and Erickson certainly emphasized that. Um, but it might be intimate friendships, but that the idea that you're going to develop intimacy in some way and have the ability for love as a personality virtue. Um, and then uh, in most of adulthood, so this would be probably from ages 30 to 65 or so, um, that you have uh, this idea of whether you develop the ability to uh, provide care. Um, so it's not caring in the sense of affection. This is provide care in terms of caretaking. Um, and so most people most easily experience this by having children. Um, but if you don't have your own children, that somehow this is about um, taking care of the next generation, um, taking care of other people, at least, even if it's not the next generation. Um, and then in old age, and I might push the 65 a little bit higher um, in modern lifespan um, compared to what Erickson would have known, um, we develop, if we're lucky, uh, the virtue of wisdom. Um, and this is somebody in old age who essentially is at peace with themselves, um, that they um, have a sense that they have had a life well lived, that they have done the best with the circumstances that they were handed, um, and, um, and that uh, they, feel, um, they feel that they've been fortunate in some ways at least, um, whereas despair is about wishing for a do-over, essentially. And as long as you're wishing for a do-over, according to Erickson, you're not going to develop wisdom. Um, so, so we can talk more about these, but I think this basic virtue list is um, a really important way of thinking about that. Um, so uh, we'll come back together and we'll talk about other theorists in class two.